Brumley Law. Thanks so much for joining us today for our Brumley Talks. Um, many of you are already probably familiar with the Brumley program, but um, just in case, since we have a captive audience, we're going to go ahead and um, mention it and plug it. Um, we um, have this fellowship program essentially where we match uh, graduate students with a faculty mentor um, working in a different field. So really um, embodying the Strauss Center's broader mission to bridge across disciplinary boundaries and just provide different perspectives um, for graduate students. So for those of you who have not already been or are not currently a Brumley Fellow and might be interested, um, we can talk more later. Um, but in the meantime, we're just very um, lucky to have um, Professor Arzu Osamu here with us today. Um, and we just want to welcome you to our talk today on forgiveness work, forbearance in our criminal justice uh, sanctioning system. So Ari Talani, one of our um, Bromley Fellows this year, is going to come um, introduce her a little bit more. Thanks so much. Thank you everybody for coming. My name is Ari Talani. I'm a master's candidate at the Center for Middle Eastern Studies. I'm very excited to introduce Professor Arzu Offenlu. She is the director of the Middle East Center and an associate professor in the Department of Law, Justices, and Societies, or excuse me, Law, Societies, and Justice at the University of Washington, Seattle. She is a legal anthropologist who examines the intersection between law and society in contemporary Iran. She is the author of The Politics of Women's Rights in Iran, and her talk that she's going to be giving today is based on her forthcoming book, Forgiveness Work, Mercy Law, and Victims' Rights in Iran, which is supposed to be coming out next year. So thank you. We're all really excited. Well, thank you so much, Ari. Thank you all for coming, and um, I want to start by thanking Ari and Ashley and the Brumley Speaker Series and the Strauss Center for inviting me. Um, I am very interested to share some of this work with you. I do think, I mean, it certainly has to do with law, and I think some of it has to do with security as well, but maybe some of that will come out more in the question and answers. Um, so I have been working on this project in Iran, um, in their criminal justice system, where the families of the victims possess an individual right of retribution in the cases of any uh, personal injuries, but the most egregious one, murder, is the one that I've been studying. <clears throat> and a lot of the research that I did, not all of it, was in criminal court in Iran. Um, and so I want to start with one of the cases that really informed my thinking. Um, and it was a criminal trial that took place in Tehran's provincial criminal court in late August 2016, when a wife and her two daughters accepted the charges of having murdered their husband and father and of dismembering the body with an electric saw, I know some of you are going to use it, <laughs> and putting the pieces in a big plastic bag until they were found out. Now, at the end of the nearly three-hour hearing, the chief judge brought the trial to a close by having the plaintiffs, that is, the victim's brother and two sisters, and the defendants sign off on their oral testimony. He then looked at the parties on both sides of the room and said, I think you need to talk. As he proposed to clear the courtroom of spectators, he proclaimed, in this case, there's room for forgiveness. And so, with the party's agreement, the chief judge, along with his two associate judges, stepped out of his role as fact finder to that of mediator, holding a reconciliation meeting between the parties, that is, the victim's nearest relatives and the defendant's at that very moment. The judge aimed to avoid the imposition of the harshest sentence the plaintiffs could demand, ressas, or retribution, which in this case would, of course, be death. In a final admonition, the judge noted, I am not taking any side in this hearing. And then he turned to the family of the victim and said, your right of retribution is preserved by the law. But I want you to consider this. Every murder 
has its reason. Now to those of us who had sat in the hearing, the three hour long year, this was a reference to the notarized letters the defendants had submitted alleging years of violent behavior consisting of beatings and verbal and sexual abuse. And the judge continued, I recommend you read the letters your nieces have written, he said to the victim's brother and sisters. The problem with the letters was that they were allegations unsupported by any other evidence besides the victim's own assertions. And during the questioning, one of the judges had noted that they had read the files, but said, give us something that can prove these claims. Did you ever tell anyone about the abuse? Over the decades of alleged abuse, the women in the family had never reported the violence, had never filed a police report, had never even confided in a single family member. Now given this society's grave concerns with propriety and honor or face saving, it surprised no one when the defendants responded with an unequivocal <coughs> no. One of the daughters testified, our mother told us that what he did to us should never leave this house. Such testimony may have been useful in making a claim that the killing was in self-defense. Without corroborating evidence, however, there was little the judges could do to avoid a finding of intentional murder, the sentence of which was retribution. But a sentence that only the victim's nearest relatives could exercise. And so the judges convened a reconciliation meeting. A tete-a-tete -tete provided the family of the victim a forum in which to air their hurt and anger. It also allowed a non-official, non-recorded, and thus face-saving venue in which the defendants could speak to the violence and abuse not as justification for murder, but as factors contributing to the defendant's state of mind. Now, such practices have been occurring in Iran on an ad hoc basis for years. Iran's new, I should say revised, actually new, uh, I'll explain that distinction later, <laughs> new criminal codes of procedure validate the judge's role as mediator even compel them to seek reconciliation between the parties. So in my talk today, I want to explore the legal right <coughs> of forbearance in Iran's system of criminal sanctioning. Now, I know that this forbearance is not something we often hear about with regards to Iranian criminal sanctioning, but I've become very interested in understanding how codification of forbearance operates, in particular in intentional murder cases, um, here, the family has the right of retribution, but they can also forego this right. But the element of the system of criminal sanctioning, that in homicide and numerous other crimes, retribution is literally the right of victims, um, is little known and little studied. Much of the research um, in general sort of criminal justice suggests that people, families of victims, seek revenge in the aftermath of the death of a loved one. And scholars suggest that this is exactly why we must have a justice system that does not give this power to victims. And so my question going into this research were, well, what are the implications of a system which provides this form of relief, um, a system, I argue, in which the preservation of victims' rights lies at its very foundation. In the larger project that uh, Ari mentioned is a book that's coming out in June, I explore what I see as an extreme victim-centered approach to criminal justice, and I do so through this ethnographic study that focuses on who forgives and how and why people do when the law gives them the right to pursue retribution. Um, since 2007, my research has consisted of going to courts and other venues where these reconciliation meetings take place. Um, it has consisted of over 180 interviews, 
life histories with myriad actors, including families of victims, judges, lawyers, uh, both defense lawyers and other <coughs> types of lawyers, prosecutors, um, but also with social workers and other lay persons who work towards forbearance. And today, in today's talk, I'm going to speak more about state actors, these judges, um, and so how the state, through its officials, works both to maintain the victim's right and at the same time to encourage them to forego it. Although forbearance can and actually does take place at any stage in the criminal proceeding, after the indictment, during the trial, after the sentencing, it rarely takes place in the setting I just described, the trial. Um, most actually take place during the implementation stage. <clears throat> Sorry, in the implementation <laughs> unit when the, the person is literally waiting um, to be executed. Um, just to give you a little bit of background on the process, after a judge in the criminal court issues the sentence for Bessas, therefore validating a finding of intentional murder, the case returns to the prosecutor's office and the file is sent to the enforcement or implementations unit, a dry ahkam. Once the appeals are exhausted and they do appeal their cases to the Supreme Court, um, then Iran, the head of Iran's judiciary, actually has to sign off on every uh, case that has an execution. Uh, it's called an estizan, which is a, a, a later uh, innovation um, to kind of make sure the legal proceedings have all been according to the, the law. Then the case is set, literally, for execution. Um, now, Iran's criminal justice system is notoriously harsh. We all know that. Um, Iran, according to Amnesty International, has the world's highest rate of capital punishment per capita. Most are for drug convictions, and a law in January of 2018 changed the drug possession laws. So the, the, if you look at the statistics from 2017 to 18 and beyond, the, the rate of execution has actually dropped, but most of those are for d drug possession cases. <clears throat> In my research, um, the government doesn't keep official statistics. It's very hard to, but um, the, I, I've kind of triangulated by speaking with judges, the judge in the uh, implementations unit, following um, newspapers that print some uh, statistics, uh, different in different provinces. But then there's an NGO in Norway. It's called Iran Human Rights, and they actually keep a tally on this. And if I triangulate my findings, about two-thirds of cases for murder do end up um, forbearing. The victims forego it about. And, and it's not hard data, but this is kind of what I've been able to uncover. And I don't believe that Iranian officials are indifferent to these statistics, and nor are they sitting by idly. <clears throat> I believe something bigger is actually at stake for them that has to do with their, what they believe is the system of justice. Um, so the issue that I examine in my research is <coughs> specific to this death penalty for murder. And I think in my analysis, I'll speak to some of the bigger issues of, around advocacy for death penalty. But through this particular case, I want to understand in socio-legal terms what the phrase, as the judge said, room for forgiveness means. How does forgiveness come about? Um, so let me first say a few things about Iran's justice, a few more things, I guess, about Iran's justice system. Then I'll situate forgiveness in this case a bit more, and I'll con conclude, hopefully, with some <laughs> thoughts about anti-death penalty activism. And if I forget to or run out of time, I'm happy to do so in the Q&A. So many of you know that after 1979, Iran's religious leaders rewrote the national laws to conform with Islamic principles as they see them. And I think that's an important phrase to consider. Many revisions to the criminal laws um, came about in 2012 and 2015, <clears throat> um, when it's hard to imagine, but that was the first time since the revolution that both the criminal, the substantive criminal code and the code of criminal procedures were finalized. Up until then, it, they were temporary 
and every four years they, they would slightly alter them, but the, the Majlis, Iran's parliament, would uh, change or ratify these, extending them every four years. But they were actually finalized in 2012 and 2015, respectively, the substantive law and the procedures. And they, as I've been saying, they maintain this um, severe, if you will, retributive sanctioning where the family of the victim owns the right of retribution, but they also codify in much clearer terms than ever before the right of forbearance that the plaintiffs have, <clears throat> which they say derives from the Muslim mandate to be merciful and compassionate. <coughs> now this religious obligation to be merciful and compassionate serves as the basis for the substantive law, as I said, that allows for forbearance in the penal code. The codes of criminal procedure also create what I call an <coughs> imperfect duty on the part of government officials to bring about reconciliation whenever possible. And this is new in the 2015 updated or finalized codes of criminal procedure. So what that means is that the penal codes recognize forbearance as a right, and the codes of criminal procedure as well call on government agents tasked with carrying out the substantive law to do so, nevertheless, with an eye toward the greater goal of achieving reconciliation. And there are numerous uh, provisions in the codes that do this. <clears throat> now this moral and legal obligation notwithstanding, there are virtually no <coughs> guidelines regulating how these government officials, or others for that matter, should do this work of bringing about forbearance or reconciliation. Nor do the codes specify any agency or groups who are charged with these aims. So hence my judge, uh, uh, hence a question that I had about, well, why would the judges do this? Now this tension, the moral duty with no guidelines, has been a productive one. <clears throat> Over the years, numerous groups and individuals, political and non-governmental, have intervened in murder cases to which they are not parties, they have no stake, with the aim of bringing about reconciliation between victims and perpetrators. The absence of meaningful guidelines alongside a manifest moral and legal duty to forgive has generated even more, what I would argue, is a cottage industry of advocacy that engenders numerous avenues for negotiating forgiveness and forging reconciliation. And I use this term cottage industry intentionally I want to highlight the informality, the small, concentrated, loosely organized, as well as the ritual forms that engage what is become, what has become, a flourishing complex of activity or industry around forgiveness, especially when it comes to capital punishment. Um, just a quick theoretical note. So when I'm thinking about this idea of the cottage industry, I'm drawing from the work of socio-legal scholar Sally Falk Moore, who, her notion of, of semi-autonomous social fields. And she, in a very old article from 1973, she argued that we need to study how um, groups have these semi-autonomous arenas in which they operate. And these these um, rules, th these uh, semi-autonomous fields have their own rules and regulations and guidelines separate from the state. And she says that these semi-autonomous social fields, they have their own rule-making capacities and they do in interact with the larger social matrices, but they're sort of independent. And she, her approach is to get us to think about um, Studying autonomy, even within like broad, even if you will, in the case of Iran, authoritarian states, there's a lot of room for autonomy, and these social fields will develop and yield some of their own regulation, which can have valuable information for you know agency and social life and, and complex processes that go on within that. Now, what I'm doing is slightly the opposite, right? What I'm saying is the state, through this productive tension, creates this moral and legal duty that itself
gives way to a semi-autonomous social field. Because there are no guidelines, they kind of set their own guidelines. And I won't have time to get into this today, but there's even competition between these groups. Some groups are very, very religious groups. Some groups are anti-death penalty, secular human rights groups. And so these all, all have emerged throughout this. Um, so the aim of the broader project is to approach, is to have a better understanding of the processes that create this industry I call forgiveness work um, that moves families of victims to forgive, but a lot of the actors in this forgiveness work project have a broader aim, and that is to change the cultural foundations on the ground, <coughs> to make forgiveness much more palatable over retribution. So going, let's go to this meeting, this reconciliation meeting that the judge proposed. With the room cleared, there remained just, just the judges, three judges, the prison guards, the, a psychologist from the juvenile correction center because one of the daughters was under 18, two social workers who were also present at the request of the defendants, a couple of journalists, and myself, the researcher. So this is the room cleared, if you will. Now, to assure the propriety of what was about to take place, the chief judge reiterated the end of the hearing. He said, everything is over. This is the start of the reconciliation meeting. Now, this was an important move for the judge to situate his role as the arbiter of justice, the trier of facts, from now being a mediator, a reconciliation uh, actor. So as though taking those words as a cue to step away from the role of impartial trier of fact to sage advisor, one of his associate judges literally jumped off the judge's raised platform and he walked over to the parties, his arms held out, reiterating, there's room for forgiveness in this case. This judge had read the detailed letters of abuse and was apparently swayed by the pleas on the part of the interpreter, in, uh, of the perpetrators, while they, the letters carried no legal weight, they were worthy of sympathy. And he first spoke to the uncle. So there's two aunts and an uncle. And the uncle says, look, I'm not ready to execute, but I am exploding with grief right now. So many times I told them, come, talk to me, but they never did. The other time I said, if you don't like my brother, just divorce. All these people are getting divorced. Still up from his raised platform, the chief judge spoke, we don't want to hear this now. He doesn't want to retry the case, right? And then more softly than when he was the trier of truth, our duty in all of our files is to arrive at reconciliation. And I want to ask this of you, that you try to come to a solution between you. <coughs> Then one of the aunts said, they don't pray, as a way of undercutting the young woman's character and credibility. And now she was looking directly at her two nieces. If my brother was so bad, why didn't you tell me? The young women were shepherded by the social workers and prison guards towards their uncle and aunts. Go, plead with them. When the aunts stood and also approached, the guards interjected with their hands and told, don't touch them. The aunts began loudly castigating the young women. And the guards kind of closed in to protect the women from any physical attack. The journalist and myself kind of hung back, <coughs> taking in the situation. Then the girls fell to their knees at the feet of their aunts. They pulled their headscarves below their foreheads, lowered their heads to the floor, and they begged for their lives through tears. Forgive us. Please, please forgive us. Why should we forgive? Why should we be merciful when you were not? Now everyone, including the prison guards and journalists, were advocating to spare the lives of the women. Different women spoke with different degrees of rapidity, the social workers, the prison guards, the psychologists. Some were speaking in Turkic, the ethnic language of the family. They did wrong, but you do right. I will not consent. I will not give up my right to retribution. By killing them, you won't receive God's mercy. 
The chief judge was tidying up his desk. And he looks out and says, with your mercy, you will help them become better people. But those things they said about, about our family, our honor, no, we won't, we won't forgive. Then the, the judge who had jumped off the stage, you saw that we didn't accept the things they said about him. They're your brother's family, his children. Do this act of kindness. Do it for him, for his memory. It will bring you peace and rewards from God. The, the chief, this associate judge, was attuned to the effect that the women's testimony had on the family of the victim, the, the loss of honor, right? And, a cons and, and, a con and the, the consequences of that testimony on the chances of forbearance. The testimony, while providing context and motive in the defendant's legal case, elicited anger and more grief by the siblings, by the victim's family. In such context, families of victims often spoke to me about a double injury. First, they have to contend with the physical loss of their loved one, but now, on top of that, they have to endure the desecration of his and their, by extension, reputation and honor. Here, the legal process of truth-seeking clashes with the culture of face-saving. And this particular tension arose frequently as a delicate conundrum in the context of forgiveness work. How could the family of the victim forego retribution or even forgive the perpetrator after the disparaging claims that the defendants made, even if only as a legal defense? In such context, families feared that others, too, would see their potential forbearance as a validation of the defendant's claims. On the other hand, carrying out the retribution, some felt, would prove and punish what the family saw as lies and provide relief to the surviving kin and a certain redemption on the part of the deceased, his reputation. Most hearings that deal with questions around morality and chastity, such as rape, are held in camera with no public in attendance. And even when only one of the charges has to do with sexual conduct, judges clear the courtroom for that testimony um, in a particular case. Um, but in this case, the testimony was more difficult to play down because it was presented as part of the defense. The judges further admonished the defendants to avoid testimony that would harm, uh, uh, that would harm them and they, during the hearing, they reiterated over and again to the defendants, be careful what you say. We read the file as a less than subtle reference to the fact that they were aware of the sexual abuse allegations. And then the aunt interjects, but my brother did not do those things. He didn't. Now, the associate judge, interestingly, turns to the older of the two girls, the daughters, and says, say you made a mistake. Just like that. Just say you made a mistake. And so she repeated, I made a mistake. Her younger sister repeated that as well. Finally, their mother comes over. She says the same thing. The judge apparently saw an opening, called for the clerk to bring him the court's official forms. He looked at the sisters and said, look, they admitted they were wrong to have done the things they, to have done, uh, to, to have done that, to have said those things about him. Now, have mercy and you will find peace. And he began dictating the contents of the forbearance statement while the clerk wrote it in long hand. The judge also called over the journalist, one of the journalists, and said, interview the aunt and uncle. Clarify for the record that their brother was not an immoral person to be published in the next day's paper. The journalist stepped forward, knelt in front of the uncle, and began writing. While the associate judge went to work on the forbearance affidavits, the social workers stepped in, and they clarified what appeared to be a point of confusion for the aunts. No, the girls will not be freed if you forego retribution. They will go to prison for 10 years. A prison guard added, even after being released, they'll have parole. One of the prison guards um, said, and they won't get uh, furlough, prison release either. Another social worker chimed in, and you can receive compensation. 
And Uncle uh, sort of expressed uncertainty about taking that compensation, and the judge came back and said, if you don't want it, take it and give it to charity, uh, but let them pay something, they said. Well, the sta these statements of forbearance had the legal effect and the agreement between the parties would be approved by the court. None of these assurances by the social workers or the prison guards had any weight. Upon the approval of forbearance, the case would be remanded back to the same court for sentencing, but for a completely different offense, the public offense of disturbing public peace and security. While the maximum sentence for such an uh, offense was indeed 10 years. Um, it was, it's really between three and 10 years minus time served. There was no guarantee that the woman would receive any, <coughs> excuse me, of, of it. Um, nevertheless, the time had come to sign. The judge offered the, ans the document and hesitatingly, they signed it. And the, it's interesting, the, the statement, the standard idiom is that they forego their right of retribution without doubt or condition. And this is a legal term of art that would not invalidate any extra, external, if you will, agreements between the parties, including the compensation. <clears throat> and so they, ch they, they signed, and now they're celebrating, the girls are crying, but out of happiness and caution, caution, cautious happiness. Um, they're now herded back to prison, this time no handcuffs. As we filed out, others were congratulating the judges on how well uh, they presided over the hearing and handled the reconciliation meeting. The judges seemed unaffected by it all. I actually bumped into the chief judge in the elevator. And I noted how rare it was to see such meetings just after the trial, like before the official ruling had even been issued. And I said, how did you know to hold this meeting right away? He said, 43 years of experience. <laughs> a few days later, the associate judge was a bit more forthcoming. And he said, I knew by their hesitation. When I asked them what they wanted to do, the uncle especially, did not want retribution. I knew these were not the type to carry out ressas. And since I knew they would eventually forego retribution, I thought we could just finish it right there. So I want to say a few words about motivations. Um, when I went back a few weeks later and met with the chief judge to talk more about his motives, he declared, well, this is in our laws and in our religion. The phrase, in our religion and in our laws, is one I often heard in the process of carrying out this research. Um, and it was frequently made to me by state officials. But it raised an important question about the relationship between law and religion. What does it mean in an Islamic republic that bureaucrats make a distinction between the two? In Iran's Islamic Republic, it is the government representatives who have the final and definitive word on state laws based on their readings of the religious sources. The distinction between religion and law is important because in the final analysis, the law is a question of state sovereignty. Ultimately, the state's monopoly on law and its interpretation overtake the heated debates and nuance found in fair or Islamic jurisprudence. So in this context, the fact that the judge points out his religious duty as having significance is important. Such an obligation suggests a concern with ethics derived from a duty towards God, which is not sublimated or reduced to the worldly concerns of the state or the state's monopoly on legitimate violence, i.e. law. It remains, however, that what is being adjudicated in the criminal court is law, not Sharia, not Shah. In, in Persian, it's Shah, not Shah. Not Islamic principles. Rather, the court's processes reveal how law 
conceals by its very codification the ethical attributes, the room for nuance, the room for forgiveness, and space for debate implicit in Shad, while at the same time securing the state's sovereign authority over the people. While the scholarly debates in the seminaries of Om or Najaf in Iraq highlight changing, fluid, evolving nature of the Sharia, their codification by the state as law ossifies the principles and disassociates them from their ethical underpinnings, the very basis <coughs> of their fluidity. It is thus left up to individual judges, the better trained among them in both Shad and its ethical foundations, to apply a skilled ethical discretion in their application of the criminal codes. The ossification and inflexibility of law is apparent in the codification of homicide, of the homicide crimes themselves, for which there are only three categories. Intentional murder, unintentional murder, and negligent homicide. As one defense lawyer told me, this is a big problem in the law. Judges are forced to give the ruling for intentional murder when it's not always so. Few exceptions exist in law, and judges have little discretion in exercising in, in the ruling, right? But the revisions to the law permit some argument on the part of lawyers that there were circumstances that mitigate a sentence of intentional, uh, intentional murder. This is new. But the point that I'm making is that legal code thus constrains the law. And for the first three and a half decades of the Islamic Republic, that's what the emphasis was on, the reinstitution of the foundational aims of preserving the right of the victim's families and the state preserving its sovereignty. The new revisions to the law, however, offer increased flexibility, discretion, and even alternative sanctioning. Um, while not in, not in Sharia crimes, that's like a, something outside of the, this current project, but I, I do have some work on alternative sanctioning. While the judges cannot forego the this sauce and the law constrains them in their sentencing in this respect, their discretion, however, is broadened and their duty to seek reconciliation is emphasized. Um, of course, this discretion can be problematic. The discretion is broadened in the context of forbearance. Duty to seek reconciliation and bring the parties to settlement can offer possibilities for forbearance at any and all stages in the sanctioning process. From the original arrest and investigation to the indictment, the judgment, and later the implementation of the sanction. So I have a little bit of time, and thank you for indulging me. I know this is long. But I want to just look more closely at the laws codifying mercy. And I want to situate legal forbearance in the context of this changing and regularizing legal process that creates this problematic, if you will, on the one hand, a duty to reach reconciliation, sol, while preserving the victim's right to retribution. Only since around 1981, in murder and other tort crimes, the law, does the law provide the family of the victim with this private form of relief. And I want to distinguish this from revenge. And this is really crucial because if you don't, then you end up collapsing some important considerations in this law um, and fail to understand the specific nuances that actually make the system work for some people. The key is that the loss or injury to a loved one creates a private right of equal justice. Of course, you know, eye for an eye, there's a lot of debate as to whether there should ever be equal justice in the first place. But two important points derive from this. One, the family of the victim decides how to dispose of that right. The state sees its role, and two, this is two, the state sees its role as preserving that right. Thus, in a classic liberal sense, the sovereign is mediating over a contractual dispute. As a result, I argue, in the first three and a half decades of the Islamic Republic, the law, re the law really focused on the rights of victims. They have three choices. Forbearance, forbearance with compensation, or retribution. In those cases, the judiciary's role is one of harnessing and regulating the space for settling accounts. The state claims 
its monopoly on legitimate violence by requiring that any payback take place within the judicial proceedings, the, the process. Like, if you have a right to ret retribution, you can't go over to your neighbor's house and, and exercise it. By giving private citizens the right to ask the state to exercise that violence on their behalf, the state is implicating its citizens in its own logic for settling disputes, regardless of whether they exercise it or not. And this process bears some resemblance to state formation in common and civil law countries as well, but with notable distinctions. Um, in his, it, some of you know the work of uh, J.H. Baker in his introduction to English legal history, Baker contends that the Anglo-Saxon codes don't codify existing tribal laws, let alone make new law. Instead, what he points out is that these new codes were directed at readers who could be presumed to know already the customs, and they offered to fix them within codes. But they, according also to Baker, they previously rested on the judge's discretion. So codes limited discretion, not just in the Islamic Muslim societies, but also in common law and some civil law societies. Codes limit discretion, but still they seek to repair loss or injury based on the customs of the times. They just weren't spelled out. The codification of these tort laws, not just in Iran, but even in Western societies, are still bound up with these pre-codification customs that sought to exact damages incurred from the staining of honor, right? Like we heard it with the ants. Um, of course now, in like societies where it's tort, it's, this is carried out in torts, right? And they mostly have just monetary damages. Now, building on Baker's word, Robert Redfield, a legal anthropologist, um, described how societies moved from employing retaliative sanctions to developing what's called proto-legal institutions. And he suggested that the formalization of law emerged through the development of systems of compensation or forms of socially approved retaliation or tort law. So the overall goal, he said, of that what he called primitive law, that's the name of his article, was to rein in unlimited revenge, right? Now, he says, as this proto-tort law developed into modern legal systems, the harm that was, the harm that the law was now punishing was not just the harm done to the families or individuals, but now to the greater society. And according to Redfield, it became something we are likely to think of as criminal law. So referencing Maine's <coughs> well-known assertion from status to contract, Redfield <coughs> recognized the shift from sort of pre-modern to modern law as being one in which the legal institutions recognize their roles, the state's institutions recognize their roles as adjudicating the harm done to the greater society, i.e. criminal law, and to the individual in a separate but distinct tort law as opposed to just sort of mediating, as we saw, over contractual disputes. Codification then secularized and individuated these earlier practices and ultimately privilege the harms done to society over those of the family. And as I said, for Redfield, this was evidence in a separate and distinct body of criminal law. And so modern laws emerge not only because of codification, but this distinction between criminal and tort law. The modern laws emerge not only, oh yeah, I just said that, but <laughs> But the important point is that the state has the higher privilege and harsher punishment, whether in these so-called modern systems, right? Whether a perpetrator lives or dies is the sovereign's decision, not the family's. But others have argued, as states do shift the sort of penalty 
they also move away from the restorative aims of sanctioning. One of the primary roles of a strong state is to mediate over disputes, prevent never-ending cycles of violence, and states do that by creating a judiciary with a legal system that determines the rules for social conduct and punishment for transgression. And the Iranian system follows this insofar as it possesses a formalized system of rules that define violations and corresponding sanctions. But Iran's system is different because even though the state is concerned with people taking the law into their own hands, it does not take the right of retribution away from the family of the victim. It preserves and sustains it, thus preserving and sustaining the underlying logic of status relationships with the ready concern for honor. This is why we see so much talk of honor in Iran and some of these other societies. By giving the victim's family the paramount decision over life and death, however, the system is Iran, is still more focused on family relationships and per perceived kin structures, and thus, to some extent, on status over contract. One of the results of this is to emphasize more um, overtly honor than we see in Western societies, even though I have a, another piece that shows how honor still exists in Western legal context. It's just not open, out in the open. But the Ir Iranian system's emphasis on injury to the victim's family not only has the effect of accentuating the social importance of family honor, it also maintains or accentuates the importance of reconciliation. And in, in the broader project in the book, I talk about also entrench entrenches some gender roles that emerge from that. This is why in the case above, the concern with punishment is deeply ingrained in a justice response that rehabilitates the family's honor. Indeed, there is a deeply performative action on the part of the aggrieved family members who are permitted to announce their decision in an open courtroom publicly, reclaiming their honor by disavowing the shame brought onto them by the defendant's claims. In such context, the work that punishment does to re re uh, sorry, rehabilitate is very significant and makes the curbing of punishment through forbearance that much more challenging because the family that foregoes punishment risks losing the repair that retribution does. And so I want to just close by saying that the work that these judges do and many of these social workers is right at this perception, trying to change what they say the culture of violence or revenge from one of forbearance is, is trying to shift, not the, the law of Esas, which has major consequences in Iran, but actually trying to change persons' understandings of what is the loss of honor in these contexts, so that the loss of honor cannot so readily or easily be rehabilitated through retaliation, but rather forbearance. So I will end with there. Thank you for your indulgence and